viewers. Those of you who've been our regular viewers, and I know most of our long-term viewers, most of you watch on the internet. So you'll be familiar with just how special this leopard truly is to us. So to be reunited with him, I mean, I don't think that, to be honest, I don't think that he cares either way who's watching him. He's, we're so naturally a part of his life. But to be reunited with him and to see him once again is a very uplifting experience. It's just such a special story and a story that through every step, I always felt was never going to have a happy ending. Well, at least I hope for a happy ending, but the the part of me that was trying to be the most rational and to prepare myself for the worst was prepared to accept that we may never have seen Sindelia again. And to see him back here is incredible. To watch how the situation plays out is absolutely fascinating. And to wonder what on earth is going through this little leopard's head, or not so little anymore, big leopard's head, because he certainly has grown. What must he have thought yesterday with his mother? Oh, oh, foot, foot on thorn. It's also incredible to see how much he's grown, how his face has stretched out. He's got that adult male leopard face, but still young male. And I'm pretty sure that of all of the leopards, a young male leopard is one of the most attractive to look at. They're just so incredibly perfect looking. And there you go for a quick update for those of you who are concerned about the collar and the way in which it is, or where it is situated and how it might affect him. That collar does drop off eventually. So he will be, I think he may be fitted at some point with another collar. We're not, I'm not entirely sure. There's a good chance he may be fitted with another collar, but obviously as a young leopard, he is a growing boy and he will need space to fill out. Fortunately for us, the people that are in charge of monitoring Sindile and have been responsible for releasing him, or rescuing him and then releasing him, know exactly what they're doing and how to handle this situation. It is the most extraordinary story, and I think Sindile might be on his way to becoming one of the most famous leopards in the world. Because and we've been fortunate enough to watch it pretty much from start until now. Who knows where the end of the story lies? There's a chance, there's a very good chance, that we may, once Sindile does disperse, that we may not see him again. When he's old enough to establish his territory, he might move away completely in the same way that Mishu and Induna, Karula's older cubs, moved towards the Kruger and towards Manuleti. We'll just have to rely on the updates from the other guys in this area to keep us informed. Then, of course, there's the fact that in some of the long, largest dispersals recorded, male leopards can go up to a good 300, even f maybe even 400 miles from their original place of birth before they establish themselves a territory. They just keep moving until they find that basically that vacuum of male leopards or until they find an old male leopard that they're young enough and strong enough to push out and push away from their territory. We'll just have to wait and see what happens with Sindide. With his ears twitching away. I wonder what Sindile might be dreaming about. I always think that when I sit with sleeping big cats. They look so peaceful and content and so terribly comfortable, no matter how uncomfortable the position is that they've managed to find themselves in. They, I imagine chasing things falls pretty high up on that list. I wonder what made Sindile decide to come in this direction. This is a little bit far out of what he wouldn't have known as his natal range. But he's been all over the show since he was first released. Right around through Kruger, right down south towards Mala Mala, and then back up north. He just kept bouncing about, and now we have him back with us. TV is about to return to us. Now we shall prepare for their imminent arrival wait and see what Sindile decides to do.
for a moment. Let's just enjoy the sighting of this glorious leopard. And a very warm welcome back and welcome to those of you who may in fact just have jumped on board this incredible wildlife experience. On our very special Father's Day, we bring you the best and most fantastic way of viewing African wildlife, short of being here. A live safari from the center of the African bush gives you the truest reflection of the way in which we get to experience these animals. They write the stories for us, we just have to follow on and bring you what they're telling us. My name is Jamie and we are coming to you live from the middle of Juma private game reserves in the Sabi sand in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. Now don't forget on this Father's Day you may not have been able to take your dad out to the African bush for the weekend but you can send through your shout outs wherever you may be and we will pass them on to your fathers wherever they may be. So while our leopard snoozes away and does what leopards often do best, let's head across to Brent because he has something very large and something very grey. We've just found a massive elephant bull, but it sounds like there's a whole herd of elephants around here. He's almost an adult, but he's still incredibly tall. He's probably around 14 foot at the shoulder. We can see him just through there. And there he is. And there's a little female in front. And now he's not any, even fully grown and we're going to be able to see the size difference between an elephant bull and an elephant cow. Remember Father's Day, happy Father's Day to all the fathers and remember we're on a live African safari with the biggest land mammal in the world, the African elephant. And at the moment we're just joining the herd, following them as they go. Well, and uh, since it's Father's Day, my dad just tweeted. I, I said Happy Father's Day to him a bit earlier, but he's just letting everyone know on Twitter that we've grown up on a game reserve. So yes, we've been very lucky uh, in my growing up, and I've been very fortunate. That most of the firsts in the bush I've ever had have been with my dad. First time elephant on foot, first time lion on foot, uh, first time charged by an elephant. Everything was with my dad. Okay, now let's get back to the elephant. Who's Probably not a dad just yet. I guess he's mid twenties. There he goes. And he's on a mission. He's following a breeding herd. Now it's not uncommon to find these younger bulls on the peripheries of the herds. So you might see, I might drive over a little bush or whatnot, but we straddle them which means they pop up straight away once we go over them. And I'm hoping this big Ellie bull is going to lead us to another herd of elephants. Are we gonna, isn't this incredible? We're following an elephant path that is being used by an elephant on a live African safari. And you can see he's completely relaxed with his wagging tail but he is going to go into some thick bush so we're going to let him wander off we're going to see what other fabulous creatures are out and about while we do that james has got a reptile in a jar that was a fly everyone and this is a bibron's thick-toed gecko now if you are feeling a uh, a uh, little less than cheerful, say Bibron's thick-toed gecko a few times and roll your R's and you shall feel better immediately. Um, a very nice shout-out to Daniel Kirby Wilcox II from his various offspring. I hope you're having a wonderful Father's Day. Now, this Bibron's thick-toed gecko 
is now, well, it's dead. You can see his name's Gregory the Gecko, and he has long since deceased. But we can get a wonderful picture with this microscope of his feet. Now, you've all seen geckos in your homes, and you've wondered how on earth it is that they manage to stick to the surfaces that they do. Well, that's how. Look at those pads on the bottom of the gecko's feet. I think that's incredible. Now, on each of those pads is a hair, and the hairs are no more than five microns across. That is five thousandths of a millimeter. Now, I don't know what that is in the imperial system because inches, I don't think, go down to as small as five millionths of a meter. So that's how a gecko manages to stick onto the wall of your house. I think they're wonderful creatures because they like to, uh, well, they like to eat all the flies and the mosquitoes that knock about the place, and I think that's a great thing. Now, we can go back across to the rover. Let's have a look here. And <laughs> I moved Ronald, and you can see there that that buffalo, which was looking at him very suspiciously indeed, is now chewing its cud. You can see just below Ronald's eye level there. You can see chewing away thoughtfully. There is the damn camera. You can see there that Ronald is now about, just to give you some perspective, he's probably about, I don't know, 40 feet or so from that buffalo. A deeply aged old buffalo bull. Probably won't be a father again. Probably is a father though. And all over him, you would have seen those amazing birds. Those are called ox peckers, and they like to eat the ticks and other ectoparasites off a beautiful animal like that old grizzly buffalo bull. Let's go back to our friend, the feral giraffe, Mr. Brent Leo Smith. He's got more elephants. Look at that, isn't just the cutest thing. We didn't have to meander far before we stumbled on another herd of elephants. And this baby is a matter of months old. It is tiny. Hello, Mom. Here we go. Mom's got some a snack to take with on her way through. But we're going to stick with this elephant herd. There's probably about 60 of them all around us at the moment. Now, she's a really nice big female. She's also tuskless, which is quite unusual. And you do find tuskless cows from time to time. Remember, we are being surrounded by elephants on a live African safari in the middle of the African bush. I'm on Juma, uh, sorry, no, I've jumped across to Arethusa private game reserve at the moment. And if you want to send your dad a shout out, or you want to ask a, a question about these incredible animals, you can do that using the hashtag Safari Live. But behind us is the only daddy I've seen in this herd. He's a big bull. He's definitely sired a baby or two. Who knows, maybe even that little baby we just saw. So sometimes they do join the herds and he's got a beautiful set of tusks on him as well. Hello, mister. Safari Live, welcome to Denise and her son, who is four years old and joining us on this live safari. Great to have you on board. She'd like to know how tall that little elephant who just went past us was. About, I would guess, about 40 inches at the shoulder. And look, this is a, a big adult bull. He's over 30 years old. So even though elephants reach their sexual maturity in their mid-teens. The bulls are unable to mate until they get to about 30 due to the competition from the other big bulls. So it's a tough time being a male elephant till you get <laughs> to 30 years old. And they're incredibly long-lived and have about, lived to about 65. And I'm guessing this guy in front of us is maybe around 40. This massive herd is moving through the bush. I'm really hoping this big boy decides to stop snacking and come walk right next to us. Uh, when you're in these situations surrounded by elephant herds, it's very important to watch their body language. And even, oh, here he comes. Here he comes. Hello, big boy. Now, if you look carefully on his tusk, there's a very interesting little 
mark there and it almost looks like someone's carved a little hole in the tusk it's what you call a grass notch so he gets that from where he brings grass through uh, using his trunk and his tusk to pick grass and he uses that right tusk more than the left tusk so he's right tusked elephant and you get left tusked elephants as well and every now and then you get an ambidextrous elephant and while we were watching him the original elephant bull we first spotted has that decided to sneak up behind us Tasha, hi, welcome on the live safari. Hello, boy, are you coming to hello? Tasha, I'll get to you in a second. I just wanted to see if this Ellie was going to come right up to us. You can actually see our shadow right there. That's how close he is to us. There, Brian's thumbs up there. Uh, Tasha's wondering, how do I tell how old they are? Tasha, it is a bit of guesswork. I, I, I'm not going to lie. It's easier with the juveniles and uh, the, the young ones. And based on their size, you can normally tell how old they are. Uh, with these guys, if I look at the indentations on the head there, you can see um, he doesn't have deep indentations. But he's quite young. He's in very good condition. And if I have a look at the older bull, I'm just going to get you into a spot where you can see his head. You actually see how those indentations have started sinking on his skull. So that's what leads me to believe, and I could be wrong, but I'm, I'm pretty sure about this that that bull's a little bit older or quite a bit older maybe 10 or 15 years older and we are on Arethusa private game reserve at the moment in the Sabi Sand South Africa part of the greater Kruger National Park and we are in the middle of a herd of about 60 elephants isn't this absolutely amazing a live African safari if you had told me a couple of years ago that I would be taking a live game drive in the middle of the African bush, I would have uh, probably not believed you. So there we go, he's going to pop out there. Now if we look on his temple, you can see those indentations there, and that's a little bit older. And there we go, if we come out a bit please Brian, see the size difference between a female and a male. That is a particularly small female though. <laughs> Now, you might notice as we drive around and move through, there's lots of big piles of oranges stuff on the road. Now, those are the leavings of an elephant, and Steph's got some to show you. Well, thank you, James, and welcome back to the Bushwalk. For those of you who have just joined the Bushwalk, my name's Steph Winterboot, and we're right in the middle of the same area that you've been driving around in. Wasn't that big elephant bull that you saw earlier fantastic? Now, what I quite like doing is sharing my survival knowledge with you, especially all you dads out there on Father's Day. You've got something that I'm going to show you right now that will surprise your children. They'll be talking about it at school for the rest of their lives. This is a very, very big, fresh pile of elephant dung. You can see how big it is. There's my two fists. Massive. Now, water is very, very crucial out here in, in Africa. It's also very crucial to survival. You can't go more than three days without water here in, in the bush. You do more than three weeks without food, but you can't do more than three days without water. And so finding water is a treasure and one that you absolutely have to make every opportunity of getting as much as you can when it's there. Now, as you can see, this sand right here has no water in it. It's as dry as a bone. We're in the midst of one of the biggest droughts that we've got here in the country, in South Africa, in living memory. But this elephant hasn't battled to find water. Ellie's drink probably about, I don't know, anywhere up to about 50 gallons or so of water in a day. And that mostly comes out in their dung. But what you can do, oh by the way, this is a snail shell that I found nearby. These snails die in the drought. It's the biggest giant land snail that we get, probably one of the biggest mollusks on the earth, land-based ones anyway. They make very handy cups. What you do is you take the elephant dung, as you can see, fresh green vegetable juice, 
all you health conscious out there. I'm messing, that is a no-no out here. Once you've got enough, as you can see, this was actually just one piece of dung. You take it, lift it up to your mouth, and say bon appetit. Ah, doesn't taste too bad, a little bit salty, a little bit like vegetable juice, for lack of a better word. Not as many carrots as I expected, but then hey, it is elephant dung. And that's how you get water out here in the African bush. Awesome. Alright, and from that, we're going to send you over to Jamie, who's got some leopard for you. <laughs> well, Steph is so full of survival tips, perhaps he could have given some delay some lessons before he was released back into the wild. Isn't this incredible though? We are just 18 feet from a leopard on live television. A live safari with a leopard close enough for us to examine the strands of his fur is one of the most incredible things and I do hope that it provides a special little treat for all of you fathers out there. And happy Father's Day to Steph who is a father himself and will hopefully be teaching his son those lessons at some point in the future. But back to our incredible young male leopard. There is something in my experience in all my years of guiding that draws human beings to leopards. Not, I mean, to be up close and personal with them, but there is just something about their majesty and their grace and their sheer beauty that people find irresistible. And almost inevitably you find when you have guests that have come to stay at a safari lodge, they're desperate to see the leopard, the most elusive of Africa's big cats. Uh, the females are graceful and awe-inspiring. The males are just incredible with their large thick necks and the young males are the absolute characters of the bush. Young males of Sindile's age are just so incredibly intelligent. Let's just have a close, oh he's giving us a nice, have a nice look at the side of his mouth and the side of his spots because it gives us a chance to answer Jan's question who is watching. Happy Father's Day Jan! You want to know what do you call the unique markings on a leopard's face? They're at spot patterns, Jan. That's all that it is. Oh, he's giving us hello boy. An incredible view of his intact pearly whites, those long, sharp canines. Well, Jan, it's fantastic to have you on the safari. They are the spot patterns, and each and every leopard is completely unique. Isn't that incredible to think there, is no, there are no two leopards in the world that look exactly the same? And that applies to the spots all over their bodies, including that of their face. But what we look at when we identify the individual leopard is the top spot pattern, the top row of spots that runs along their whisker line. So from what I've been able to see of Sindile, he is what we would call a 3-3 three, three leopard. So he's got three spots on the left and three spots on the right. But that combination in all of the leopards can be something like a 4-3 or a 3-3 or a 2-1, anything like that. So while our leopard sleeps and we wait for the shadows to creep further up and for Sindile to get up, let's go back over to Brent, whose elephants are providing him with endless entertainment. We are surrounded by elephants right now. They are less than a few feet. I've got literally one two three four five six seven eight nine ten right in front of me including a tiny little baby there's the little baby you can see how close they are to us it's amazing remember a live safari in the middle of africa and we're surrounded by elephants there's even one right next to brian brian there's literally it's about two feet from Brian's back at the moment. We... Brian just to swing around slowly. Look at this. She's just, I mean, literally she could have plucked Brian out of the seat there with her trunk if she had wanted to. Happy Father's Day, everyone. That was really special. Look at 
this right little one. You can see the tiny little tusks coming out, probably around four years old. Now, Brody, hi Brody, welcome on the safari. Would like to know how strong or powerful an elephant's trunk is. Put it this way, Brody, they could probably snap me in half. And they can break massive branches. They can lift fallen trees with those trunks. Even an elephant of that size will be incredibly, incredibly strong. And now there's just the big bull still on his way. I'm trying to see. We're in quite a thick area here. There he is. Now he's just keeping on the peripheries of the herd, following them. They are going into some very, very, very thick bush. So I'm going to let them be. They've given us such an amazing time. And while we try to find our way out of the middle of this bush where there's not a road in sight, right, let's go to James, who's got a retired creature. Well, everybody, I have my old friend here, George the Giraffe. And I imagine that Brent Leo Smith's skull looks something like this if you were to get under all of that impressive locks of hair. Uh, he is about as tall as George once was. George, of course, is now very short, owing to the fact that he no longer has a spinal column or indeed the rest of his body. This is just his head. But George is still making a valuable contribution to the ecology of this area. Look in the back there and you can see what looks like a little waxy pimple. Can you see that? Now, I'm going to show you, look at that, there's a stingless bee coming out of the waxy little pimple there, and that's because inside George's not insubstantial cranium, Brent has a bigger brain than this giraffe did, and not in, inside it lives some stingless bees. Now let me just get some focus on them with this microscope, and maybe we'll have, be able to see them in glorious high definition. There we are. Let's see. Now, what we want is one of those bees to come out, of course. They've been very, very confiding for the last little while. What I'm going to do is just, there he comes. There comes a bee. Come on, fella. Don't be afraid. It's Father's Day. And I know that you are not a father, and you will never be, because you are a sterile female. But that's okay. You're still welcome to Father's Day. While we wait for this bee, a lovely shout-out from Christy. There he comes. Christy, you wanted to wish your father a very happy Father's Day, he's no longer with you, and I'm sorry about that, but I'm sure wherever he is, on whatever shore he is living, in a far greater light than we are living here, I'm sure he appreciates your shout out to him. So thank you, Christy. Look at this amazing bee. Isn't that incredible? Look at his mouth parts. Beautiful. Oh, another one. Just deposited a bit of wax there. Incredible, incredible stuff. The two feelers, the mouth parts, these are all females, like I say. And, of course, this a matriarchal society run by a queen. And that's why they're not fighting with each other, of course. I think that is just one of the most spectacular pictures I have ever seen. Isn't that unbelievable? They do make honey inside the cranium. Apparently, I've never eaten it, but it's a rare delicacy out here that people like to eat. And it's quite, um, it's sourish honey. It's sort of sweet and sour honey, not like the honey bees make. Let's go back to the ultimate ultimate survival man who is now uh, not drinking elephant dung but seemingly lying inside it. <laughs> almost lying inside it James, almost lying inside it. Welcome back to the bushwalk everybody and you know what we've got one of my favorite favorite insects right in front of us right here. This is a grass-like mantis. Just have a look at that. How camouflaged is he? I want to pick some grass over here and bring it next to him to show you how much like grass he looks. And that's obviously where he hunts. He hunts on grass piles and on piles of elephant dung like this, catching whatever he can. Flies, grasshoppers, crickets, bees and wasps. Can you believe it? These arms extend almost double. That there extends double. Is, has these <laughs> what he did there was he attacked his reflection in the lens. Look at those wicked spikes that he has on his catching forelimbs. Have a look at that. Can you imagine if these guys were as big as giraffes? 
What's fascinating for me is even his eyes are camouflaged. Let's see. Even his eyes are camouflaged, looking like grass seeds. Just one of the most impressive hunters I can ever think of. Relying solely on his ability to blend into his background, to meld into his hunting environment, so that he can catch whatever he needs to. Just have a look at that. Some of my favorite things, I must be honest with you, these small little insects and these small creepy crawlies, this is actually my passion. I absolutely love seeing how Mother Nature has equipped them to occupy all the niches that they do and hunt. There he goes, immediately looking like a piece of grass, extending those forms. Oh, it's his reflection again. It's actually incredible. Their eyesight is actually good enough for him to see it. And that's a good two or three inches away from where you are at the moment, watching you, watching me. Now he starts to weave a little bit. That weave there was to look like grass. It's just the uncertainty that he's having at the moment. Doesn't quite know exactly what this other mantis in the reflection is up to. Seems to be mirroring his, it uh, looks like he's gonna try and strike at him again. He's saying, get off my patch. I just, cons even his coloration is identical to that of the grass, mottled, brown, black, and this tanny colored, his spiked eyes, almost the entire head that you're having a look at there, barring the antennae of course, are made up of eyes, eyes on the same plane, they binocular, meaning that he can see in depth, and that allows him to strike out to those spiked forearms of his and catch whatever's wandered too close to him, or her in actual fact. The size, probably about as long as my finger, Quite big for a mantis. Alrighty, are we going to leave this little hunter to his afternoons hunting? James has got something for you in the tent. It's not so much in the tent, but it is at the dam. Let's have a look here. Now there's the rover, that's Ronald's picture that he's looking at, and the buffalo has stood up to chew its cud, and just behind there you can see some impala. Now those impala are the most common antelope that we get out here. I'm just going to move the picture you've got so you can have a look at them there. There they are. Isn't that lovely? Beautiful, beautiful, elegant animals. Almost as elegant as Jamie, not quite. And they're all going to come and concentrate around this water over the course of the next few months because we are in a drought. We're in the dry season of that drought. That was a birchal starling that just flew off there. And the birds, the buffalo, sometimes a hippopotamus, the elephants, the nyala and the impala are definitely going to come down here and depend on this water. And you can see there, dripping from that buffalo's mouth, is a lot of saliva. Now a buffalo is an unbelievably good digestive system if they can get enough water to drink. And so more and more they're going to come down in huge concentrations to the last remaining bits of water like this. Because that will help them in their ruminations. Now... There are nine unbelievably lovely species of antelope here in the Sabi sand and we have put together a little montage of them all. Have a look. Nine beautiful species of antelope occur here at Juma. Late November is the birthing season. We marvel at wobbly wildebeest calves, fluffy diker lambs hiding in the thick bush and the playful antics of the impala lambs. All of these youngsters are able to stand within half an hour of birth and run very soon after that. They must be able to escape from the lions, leopards, wild dogs and other predators of the African wild. But before a male antelope has the privilege of fatherhood, he must fight. Astoundingly, these savage battles seldom end in death. The graceful yet powerful antelope of Juma are a constant source of wonder. 
Now, I was there for that little Nyala fight there, the sort of charcoal-coloured ones, and it was an unbelievable sighting. Just a quick shout-out to Andy Davis's father, Don, in South Carolina. You are most, most welcome, and I hope you're having a lovely, lovely Father's Day, Don. And Andy, I hope you're with your father, Don, as we sit here. Now, you are live, of course, so send us your shout-outs, your questions, hashtag Safari Live. We're in the middle of the iconic Kruger National Park, northeast corner of the most beautiful country on all of planet Earth, South Africa. Let's go back to look at the Prince of Cats. The Prince of Cats in the most beautiful country in the world. James could not be more correct. Now, my name is Jamie, and I have a tale to tell you. A tale is true as Sindile is twitching away and in fact a tale that plays a very important role. About a year ago Sindile and Shadow when I first started working here were the very first cats that I ever tracked on foot. Tracked and found on foot and I'll never forget the sight of his little face watching me from a termite mound because of course we do have to do that. Animals are not necessarily always on the road and sometimes you have to go looking for them his little face poking out at me from the termite mound. Now I said that young male leopards are absolutely incredible characters and that's because they are continuously learning. The young females as well but in my experience the young female leopard cubs tend to be a little bit more dignified than the young males. Now the story I have to tell you involves Sindile and another tracking incident a couple of months later and I'm going to preface this by telling you that I was absolutely in no way threatened during this particular incident. I went to track him. I'd seen him in the morning and I went to go and see if I couldn't find him. He'd moved from his last position. So I went for a walk. I went for a walk through a drainage line but a leopard is a tricky thing to spot and his tracks disappeared and it was time for me to start heading back towards the vehicle. And then, as I walked up the road, there was just this twitch of white in the corner of my eye. And there was little Sindile, hiding behind a bush, playing peekaboo with me. Because as soon as I saw him, he'd actually been in the process of walking out into the road to follow me. And he proceeded to follow me all the way back to the car. We basically played the most bizarre game of peekaboo I'd ever, ever played in my life. So what I'd do is I'd walk, but I'd be watching over my shoulder and he'd go into his leopard pose and he'd creep up the road and then I'd turn around and look at him and he'd duck behind a bush and pop his head out and wait for me to turn around and keep walking. I promise you he followed me about probably about 300 yards back towards the vehicle. Now I say I felt no threat and that was because he is a young he was a young cub at that point he was playful he was learning he then went on to stalk a water buck and a buffalo both of which are animals far out of the realms of possibility. All he was doing was practicing the hunting skills and thank goodness he was because look at where he is now. He really needed them in this crucial time of his life. It was the most incredible sighting I've ever had with a leopard cub and I think it was at that moment that I truly fell in love with the character that is Sindile. He is absolutely extraordinary. Now that is a cub story. Things would be very different now and he is as wild as any other animal might be. Any other leopard and we absolutely respect that fully. All of them are totally wild and although we're fortunate enough that they let us into their lives like this, they are comfortable enough in their li with us in their lives, absolutely we are constantly reading the signs they give us. Now, Jess, on the subject of his hunting, you have a really good question to have presented it to us. And I think it's a question that's on everyone's mind. So welcome, Jess, and thank you for that. The question was, would he have had to learn to hunt again on, during the time that he was in quarantine and then when he was re-released back into the wild? Jess, absolutely, he would have had to kind of learn to hunt again. But incredibly for him, that instinct was there from the moment, from that age where he stalked me up the road, that instinct and opportunism, he was already practicing the skills that he needed. And clearly, from the moment he was released, he wasn't provided with any food after that. He had to go out and find his own food, and it has worked out perfectly. That instinct, that hunting instinct that leopards has, have, is what saw him through the difficult month and a half that he has just faced but it must have been incredibly confusing. Just imagine being in the wild and now all of a sudden being taken away 
and then put back in the wild. So those hunting instincts that leopards have, that opportunism, is what could make this afternoon switch in a moment. Because where we are right now, anything could come stumbling across him and take either him by surprise or alternatively find themselves being seriously taken by surprise. You'll have to stay tuned after the break to find out if that does happen. <laughs> 